Beginning in Esther chapter 8, uh, starting off with verse 1, of course, New International Version. That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Now, even though the beginning of chapter 8 really relates to us events that occurred on the same day as Esther's banquet, they really move us into a, another division of the book of Esther in, in my breakdown of the book and outlining it. And I've entitled this section from 8 1 through 9 18 Revenge. And the reason for this is that the purpose of Esther's approach to the king in chapter 8 was, as it's recorded in verse 14, so that the Jews would be ready to avenge themselves on their enemies. And this really opens up a discussion to us related to the Jewish mindset of today and provides us as believers an opportunity to discuss where Christians stand on this point of vengeance and or revenge. So we're going to get into that. We're going to look at the process that gave the Jews permission to wreak vengeance on their enemies, but we're going to, we're going to expand this conversation out. In verses 1 and 2 that I read just a minute ago, in a total swing of circumstances, Esther now holds Haman's vast wealth. Remember back in chapter 5, verse 11, after, ha after Esther had invited him and Xerxes to the first banquet, Haman came home and he was bragging to his friends and to his family about uh, his vast wealth. And a total swing of that now, Esther now holds his vast wealth. The historian Herodotus tells us that Persian rulers would often confiscate criminals estates, property. And it seems that this is what Xerxes did because Haman was a vastly wealthy man and he gave it all to Esther. And to fully come clean, if you will, Esther brings Mordecai into the king's presence and describes who he is to her, their relationship. And as an act of total oblivion to Haman and his name, Xerxes takes his signet ring, which the passage tells us he had reclaimed from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai, put it on Mordecai's hand. And so Mordecai now has become the prime minister or grand vizier uh, of that empire, and he has the power to act in the king's name, just like Haman had. And <coughs> Esther makes Mordecai the head of Haman's estate. So Mordecai now has gone from being a Jew, marked for death, working for the government, to virtually the second most powerful individual in the Persian Empire. And not only is he powerful, but he's very rich as well because he has just automatically taken over Haman's estate. You kind of wonder what might be going on with Haman's family in the light of this transfer. Maybe they were all imprisoned until a final verdict was being made on their complicity in the attack of the Jews. We don't know, really. But just think of it. Only a few hours before, Haman's family was the most powerful family in Persia. Now, just a couple hours later, they were shamed, <clears throat> destitute, and facing treason while the very one they wanted hanged on the gallows is now their master. And it's just, you know, it's, and we've seen this in our own lives. It seems like, you know, the wheel of God moves like at a snail's pace. You know, we're wanting something to happen, and we're trusting and praying and seeking God. It just seems like that wheel is moving so slow. Nothing is happening. But it's always interesting that when God does move, when it happens,
happens, it happens fast. Here, for several months, the Jews are praying, weeping, wailing over their situation. Remember, the edict has been sent out. On the 12th month of the year, you can kill them all. And they're seeking God. And it doesn't seem like anything is happening for a couple of months at least. But when God works, he's always working for a moment. His moment. His place. His time. And when that happens, it all comes together like a lightning flash. And I think we, we've seen times in our own lives, I think, when, when the providence of God and it seemed like God wasn't even on the scene, then bam, the Lord just moves and something has taken place. And it, it's almost, you know, quicker than we can even realize. And I think even, you know, taking it over to the end time events, often the coming of the Lord is likened to a, a flash of lightning. In, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when the rapture takes place, we will be changed. It seems like it has taken forever that God finally get us here. <coughs> It'll happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And even the and allergies, y'all, sorry. But uh, even at the Battle of Armageddon, as we talked about last week, when we read from Zechariah, Jerusalem is almost totally taken. The Jews are almost totally defeated. Half the city falls before the Lord moves. But when he moves, as it's recorded in Zechariah 14, when he moves, everything in that moment changes. So it's, it's just interesting to see that as we read this passage of Scripture. But now we continue on. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. And she begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it is the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written, overruling the dispatches that Haman the son of Hamaditha the Agagite devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? And again, as we read this, we see that Xerxes, as has been his custom, as we've seen through the book, is a very short-sighted leader. For it seems that after the verdict upon Haman, the king goes back to his throne room, most probably to feel the comfort of the chair of power, you know, that type of thing. And he's satisfied that he's dealt with, you know, the problem. He's dealt with Haman. And evidently didn't think about the action of Haman and his edict upon the rest of the Jews. He seems to be satisfied and obviously thinks that Esther and Mordecai are secure or it could be that knowing him, as we've come to know him in the book, maybe he thought he would be able to enrich himself even more. He's already taken over Haman's estate, which was vast. So now with the rest of the Jews being killed, he might really rack up here, you know. Xerxes still doesn't seem to have gotten the point of the interest of the God of heaven and earth in the Jews. Nor does he look broadly at the needs of the group beyond just the needs of those he favors. That almost has a modern ring to it, doesn't it? It's the point that leaders in government still miss today. We will take care of those that we see as important, we see as needing, and we see as friends of ours, our support people, but at the same time, not dealing with the broader issue of all of the people that should be involved in an act. So Ezra has to plead again for her people. Verse 6 it tells us. Most commentators see verses 3 through 6 as a continuation of what has happened in verses 1 and 2. And it makes sense as Esther is 
now pleading for her people. And Xerxes extends the scepter again as a sign of agreement and, and favor, that she still is in his favor. And it's interesting now, you know, Esther has just had a fantastic triumph. But even in this moment, she doesn't take anything for granted with this king. In verses 5 and 6, she's still very respectful, very submissive, and tactful in her pleading. And she's tactful in that she doesn't remind the king of his role in the destruction and the plight of the Jews. Remember, look at what she says. If it pleases the king, if he regards me with favor and thinks it's the right thing, if he's pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches of Haman that you, O oh king, agreed with. She could have added that in, but she was tactful. She was wise. And wisdom is always wise in dealing with the powerful and the unstable. For even though you've made a great point, the king is still powerful and he's still unstable. <laughs> so, and Xerxes may have been especially sensitive at this point to how, you know, he might be seen as complicit in this. Esther knew very well that it had his signet ring on it. But she didn't bring that up. This is what Haman did. Overturn <coughs> what Haman did. And yes, it, Haman was the root cause of that. But, you know, Xerxes was complicit in it but she didn't want to anger him or distract him from the point of saving her people. Why else do you think she did it now? I mean, there's still nine months out before this edict takes place. Why do you think she continued to, you know, push the case for her people? One, you know, she didn't want to hack him off. Of course, she didn't want to say, you know, stupid. You were involved with this too, you know, and you ought not done it. That wouldn't have been the wisest thing for her to do, but what else might have been there? She wanted it with Haman still fresh. And what would have been the risk if, uh, if it hadn't stayed fresh? If she'd waited two months, three months to do this, you think? Sorry? He might have cared less. Yeah, he might have cared less. He might have been, you know, he's gotten past the point of anger at Haman, and he may not have been quite as ready to listen to the plight of the Jews. Why else? What else might have been there along with that? He might have gotten over being angry. But he also might have started thinking about that 375 tons of silver <clears throat> that Haman had promised him with the destruction of the Jews. He might have gotten to thinking about that. And being a man of whims as he was, it could be that Esther might have fallen out of the place of favor that she had right now, had she waited. So, you know, when you have the advantage, press it. <laughs> when the ball is in your court, press it. Because you never know if you wait, it may not be in your court anymore. So another aspect of just simply being wise as serpents, being sharp, being shrewd, allowing, you know, the moment to be utilized to the best. And in this case, you know, how can I bear to see my people destroyed? How can I bear to see my family destroyed? Esther knew that the edict was still law. All the Jews, which would have meant she still would have died, even though Haman was gone, she was still going to die because the law had been put into place. The king may have thought he had secured her, but not according to his law. So Xerxes, you know, in hearing this, verses 7 and 8, he replies, he says, 
He replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jews, Because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have hanged him on the gallows. Now, write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews, as best as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with the ring with his ring can be revoked. So he reminds Esther, you know, he's already given them control of Haman's estate, and he's no longer a problem because he attacked the Jews. And he notes his dilemma. No document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. But he does come up with a way of neutralizing the original decree. Write another in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you. Now this begins to bring us to this area. In reading that phrase, If you today have some people that are attacking you, maybe they're not trying to kill you necessarily, but they are attacking you. They're not your best friends, let's put it that way. And somebody gave you this statement. Well, I think you need to do something about this and do whatever you think feels good to you. How would we likely handle that? There's a couple of people that I know of that were that permission be given to me, it would be really hard to remember this first before I said, okay. I've got a couple of ideas for these folks. How about you? How does that statement strain you to be given permission to do as seems best to you in regards to people that don't like you? <laughs> that right. yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, and this kind of gets to that. Xerxes virtually gave a free hand to the Jews to do as it seems best to you, and they did. <laughs> Verses 9 through 17 gives to us the account of what they did. Esther and Mordecai gathered all the royal secretaries together and, you know, well, let, let me just read it. At once, you know, at once, the royal secretaries were summoned. On the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Sivan, they wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors, and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush, or Ethiopia today, Sudan. These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people and also the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches, dispatches with the king's signet ring and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves to destroy kill and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. This is the same day that the enemies were going to turn it over on the Jews. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers riding the royal horses raced out spurred on by the king's command and the edict was also issued in the citadel of Susa. Mordecai left the king's presence 
wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and a purple robe of fine linen. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness, and honor. In every province and in every city, wherever the edict went, there was joy and gladness among the Jews, with feasting and celebrating. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. So the king gave them a free hand in behalf of the Jews as seemed best. And they took him up on it. Verse 11 says that the new decree, the king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them, and to plunder the property of their enemies. On the 13th day of the 12th month, same day that Haman had told the enemies of the Jews that they could kill them. Now, initially, the edict was for the Jews to protect themselves from any who attacked them. That's very clear in that edict. But as you read on into chapter 9, it seems that the Jews may have went a step or two beyond the literal defense. One commentator notes it this way. They massacred those who hated them. There were no restraints imposed on them by the king. The Jews did not limit themselves to self-defense. They hunted out and destroyed those who might harm them. Their fury can only be understood by those who have experienced a long history of unjustified persecution. So, this brings us to this. Does this passage give us as believers the right to avenge ourselves? Or, put it this way, is revenge a Christian quality? What do you think? bring out a good point. It's not recorded why they couldn't hear. Unless it was intended that over that period of time the enemies of the Jews, the governors being all involved with this, the leaders prevented the Jews from being able to stand up for themselves. They may have taken this to say, no, you cannot defend. You are, this is your day. This is what's going to happen to you. And it's not a thing in the world you can do about it. Which seems very odd. But when we think back to our recent history of the Holocaust, Germany did the same thing to the Jews. You know, they first moved them out of their houses, moved them into the ghettos, from the ghettos, then they moved them to the concentration camps, concentration camps into the gas chambers. And there was very little uh, rebellion by the Jews. In Germany, there were some. They had the, uh, I think it was the Warsaw Ghetto. They had an uprising. That, but by then the Nazis were so had them so weakened, you know, and other, they had no, no real uh, weapons to be able to battle with, that they were easily overcome when they stood against the Germans. So I think maybe, you know, because it's not said, so we don't know. But certainly. That could, have been an, that could have been another option from the Lord that if Esther wouldn't have done it, somebody else would have stepped up somewhere else out of the Jewish people to, to lead a rebellion against you know, Xerxes. But, um, but possibly the government pushed down because of that decree re, re, did not allow them to be able to defend themselves because of that decree. That's the best I can come up with on that. 
maybe a better answer, but that's the best I can come up with. Against any armed force, that's what it says in the passage. When you get into chapter 9, and we will get there, but when you get into chapter 9, the Jews struck down, this is verse 5, the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. So, it reads as if it was more than just, if anybody comes after you with a sword, you can fight back. If you have enemies, speaking of the Jews, if you have enemies, they took it, we can go get them. And they did. 75,000 in total were killed as a result of that. So, does the passage give to us the right of revenge? Now, the word revenge simply means to retaliate or to inflict in return. That's basically what the word revenge means. So is revenge as an act Christian? that was meted out locally. I mean, 75,000 people across the empire, which seems like a huge number, but when you think about the, the Persian Empire at that time, going from India, parts of India and Afghanistan, all the way to uh, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, what is those areas today, I mean, you're, you're talking uh, a couple of million people at least. So it wasn't a huge number that was killed, even though 75,000 is 75,000. So in thinking about this aspect, you know, if vengeance or revenge either is or isn't, you know, if it is a virtue that we can have, how do we balance that with passages like Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48, in which Jesus says, you know, to uh, don't hate your enemies, but if they smite you, turn the other cheek. And it goes right on down that passage. So how do, we, how do we balance that? How do we look at that? And the reason that I'm pushing on this is that do we have the right to exact vengeance on ISIS? Do we have the right as believers if we're feeling oppressed, if we're feeling attacked in our own country, do we have the right to exact vengeance and revenge? I like the fine line between defense and revenge. Fine line between vengeance and revenge. And where, where do we fall as Christians? What, what is Scripture's expectation of us as believers on this? Are we to be pacifist? In other words, you know, we're against war, we're against killing. We wouldn't own a gun if we were pacifist. Pacifist, can you pronounce it? I mean, is that what Scripture is pushing us to? 
If so, we, you know, we could have a sale, you know, probably. <laughs> or does the Bible allow us to exert vengeance or revenge? Interesting question, and I think there are several things that we have to at least begin to consider with this. And, you know, if does God avenge? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And if we believe Scripture, we have to say that God, yes, God is a God of vengeance. Very clear statement there. And as one commentator notes, the concept of divine vengeance must be understood in the light of Old Testament teaching about the holiness and justice of God and its effect on man as a sinner. God cannot be true to his character of holiness and justice if he allows sin and rebellion to go unpunished. The Bible balances the fury of God's vengeance against the sinner with greatness of his mercy on those whom he redeems. God's vengeance must never be viewed apart from his purpose to show mercy. He is not only the God of wrath, but must be the God of wrath in order for his mercy to have meaning. I think that's important. God has to be a God of justice, has to be a God of holiness, has to be a God of vengeance, for his mercy to mean something. And he's, as passages in scripture tells us, God is angry with the sinner every day. His, his axe is ready to fall on the wicked at any moment. But it is his mercy that prevents that. It's his mercy that prolongs the life of each one of us, even though we foul up every day. It's his mercy that, that prolongs our lives here and gives us eternal life because he has exacted vengeance on Jesus Christ on the cross. When Christ died on the cross, the vengeance of God against sin was completely poured out so that Christ took it all on him so that we wouldn't have to be the recipients of God's vengeance. Now that's an that's a eternal and local thing coming back into play again. That we have been eternally forgiven by God because he exacted vengeance on Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, another aspect of this is that for Israel as a nation, there is a difference between individual and national needs. There were many things given to the Jews as a nation that were for them as a nation and as a people. It was expected of the Jews that they would have to fight for their survival. The Lord talked about bringing them into the land of Canaan and they would conquer the land of Canaan. He would go before them and he would fight for them and they would take the land. He actually said, don't leave a single thing living. That's vengeance. Part of that vengeance was to produce a picture of God's anger against sin. That was why he did Not because the Jews were so great and wonderful in, in and of themselves. They weren't. They rebelled as much as any of the other people. But he had chosen them, remember. So when we think of God, he is a God of vengeance. Yes, he is. Israel as a nation was expected to fight. So how does that harmonize with Matthew chapter 5 verses 38 through 48? I think for believers in the New Covenant, passages like Matthew 5 are not implying that we can't defend ourselves, our families, 
or fighting war. I don't think that's what the passage is saying. I don't think the passages like Matthew 5. And let's, let's turn to that. Yeah. Look at that passage. You, we've heard it many times, but, but really look at it. You have heard that, is, that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, Matthew 5, 38. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father in heaven. And you read on down through verse 48. But I don't think this passage is saying you can't defend yourself. That's how you live your life. If somebody just keeps coming after you, then you do what you so I stopped. You can only put up with so And that's based upon what passed? <laughs> Last <laughs> way I put it is uh, you defend your home and family, but you don't go half over across the world and kill their family. That's kind of living. I, I couldn't help but do that. The scripture is 1 8, I think. Yes, yeah, <laughs> Sigmund 1 8, yeah. That's over near 2nd point, Dexter 212. That's yeah. where it is. Yeah. I understand that. And, and I think you have a point with that. The passage doesn't say you can't defend yourself. The passage doesn't say you can't protect what is yours. The passage doesn't say that if you get shafted in a situation, don't try for regress. In other words, if your identity gets stolen, you know, you can't demand it back. This passage is not saying, well, if somebody steals your identity, let them have it. Don't. You know, don't try to get... No, I don't think the passage is saying that. What I think it is saying is that, and as one commentator noted, the ancient Hebrews, like many modern Christians, misapplied the doctrine of divine vengeance and used it as an excuse for harboring vengeful feelings against each other. Jesus was rebuking this misapplication the Bible says be angry and sin not don't let the sun go down on your wrath it doesn't say you can't have wrath it doesn't say you can't be angry the scripture says love your enemies if someone smites you on the cheek turn to them the other one if someone takes your coat give them your cloak someone wants you to go a mile go two miles love your enemies but at the same point I think what, is, what he's pointing to is a difference in life and witness. So, see if I got any room left up here. Yeah. So what he is saying in Matthew 5 and other passages like that is that we do not act in time. If someone smites you on the cheek, you do not seek to overcome power with power, necessarily, but with good actions. Romans chapter 12, verse 20, continuing to offer the gospel. Acts 14, Acts 16, both of these passages talk about how Paul reacted when he was persecuted. This may still have a reference to insult that would often have happened and did happen to a Jew that became a Christian. They were thrown out of the synagogue. They were ostracized by that community. And Jesus is saying, if this is what is happening to you, go ahead and offer the other cheek to them as part of your witness for Jesus Christ. If you are deprived, someone takes your coat, be willing to be vulnerable again. We've all seen people, we may say it, they, we may have ourselves been in a place to where we've been suckered over something and it really soured us. Ain't nobody going to use me again. 
and we just shut off any sense of, you know, I'm not going to be vulnerable again. The gospel says, for Jesus' sake, be willing to be vulnerable again. This is, this is a given for missionaries. They go work in a foreign land. They get rejected by the people. They stay. Even though you know, we've heard, you know, even the movie about the missionaries down in South America that were murdered. And the guy's wife went back. They were willing to be vulnerable again. And being taken advantage of, if you're ripped off as a Christian, don't stop being generous. I guess it's all, all of our mentality to be Jeremiah Johnson or Judge Wales, but we just can't be that way. Yeah. Like you say, we, us as Christians, we have a witness. We have a witness. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, as far as our witness goes, when you're looking at what is happening to you, if it's based upon and surrounds your testimony to Jesus Christ, yeah, you don't respond in kind. You be willing to be vulnerable again. You continue to be generous as a believer. But Jesus also said, and this is where the difference comes between witness and life. In chapter, Luke chapter 12, verse 39, he used the vigilance of a homeowner as an example of being ready for his coming because he said, if the, if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his home to be broken into. That sounds like defense to me. That sounds like, you know, I ain't letting you come into my house. You ain't coming in here and take my stuff and hurt my family. And he used that as an example. So I think there is a difference. It goes back to Brad's point. Life, you know, I pushed him on that. Luke chapter 12, verse 39, needs your verse. There you go, bro. You know. And as a believer, yeah, we've got to be willing. But now, if someone comes to rob your house, they don't care whether you're Christian or not. You know, they're coming to rob your house. You come through the door. You come through the door. Yeah. I know, yeah. You, you know, your behind's mine. You come through the door. And just so all y'all know, they don't have to be in the house because they changed that law. Mm -hmm. you, just yeah, you can't. Say, yeah, you can't. You have to say I felt really scared for my life. So I guess <laughs> but you will probably be charged for murder until they finally get it cleared up. So just, you know, also. You just have to say that. Yeah. 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 So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you dig a hole and bury them. They might really will charge you <laughs> with that, you know. But, but it, it, it does, you know, see, now I think this is important for us because there's, there's a lot of times we wonder. And in our country, in our world, People are being attacked because they're Christians. Where, how do we balance? How do we maintain our, our allegiance and dedication to what Scripture says and at the same time know what to do when they come to try to hurt you? And I, I think it's, it's really important for us, you know, to really look at this and think about it. We're not told a whole lot in Scripture about what to do as a believer during the tribulation period. Whether you're pre or post. No. For those believers that are in the tribulation period, what do you do? We're not told. There, there really isn't any Scripture except... I knew you were just waiting. I knew that was coming. That's why I said, whether either pre or post, there will be believers in the tribulation that got saved after the pre, you know, if you, if you go that route. That's why there's no instructions. Well, there'll be people saved during the tribulation period, so that, you know, what, what are the instructions for them? There aren't any. There aren't any. And I think it, the basis of that is an individual understanding of balancing out the scriptures that we have right now. 
of how we live as a Christian life. When the tribulation comes, they still hold truth. They will still hold truth. Although the pressure on us will be tremendous in the tribulation period. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and think about this. Are there, are there other questions that kind of come up? And we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this next week. But, um, no, but this is funny. This, this is the truth. I didn't text Dale because I was running like 89 miles an hour, but I started to text him the two things before I go out next year. I started to say, I need a gun and I need to learn to speak Spanish. <laughs> I promise you guys, that's what I thought. Just text Jeremy. That's what I thought that. I said, I need a gun and I need to learn how to speak Spanish. Those were the two things that I didn't have that if I drive next year, I need. And, and I think, you know, and I don't know about speaking Spanish, but I think, you know, the gun for protection is, is a wise thing to be able to do. Yeah, it speaks any language, yeah. But that's I didn't say nothing, man. So, you know, but I, I, think, I think we have to look at this because, you know, we have this battle going on in America over gun control and all this. And should there be some limitations, I definitely think there ought to be. Any not hit can have an assault weapon, please. I mean, we don't even let our kids handle guns like that. We teach them because you don't be stupid for once and something terrible happens, either to yourself or to somebody you didn't mean for it to happen. And I think there has to be some sense of balance, but at the same time, in, uh, as Christians, how do we how do we look at this stuff? How do we balance? You see, this we take the guns. They don't use a truck. They don't use a truck. They use a bat. They don't care. Yeah. They got it in their mind. Somebody's gonna die. Yeah. That's why. That's why the whole issue about you know if you take away guns, they won't do it. No, that's that's you know that's it's ridiculous on so many levels. But certainly, if they're planning on hurting you. As we've seen in Germany and in Nice, they'll use a truck, they'll use an axe, they'll use a knife, whatever they can get hold of because their intent is murder. Not just murder with a gun, their intent is murder, whatever they can use to do that with. And we've already seen airplanes, I mean, you know, what else is coming? So, you know, I, I think, you know, think about it, we'll talk about it some more next week, but, you know, really in looking at, I think, as part of our Christian witness, we don't act in kind, we're willing, we're generous. When it comes to living life, we are to, yeah, I know it's time, uh, we are to protect ourselves. So, let's, we'll talk about it some more. Good conversation, thank you. Grab a donut, eat it during church, it'll hack somebody. Else. <laughs>